Tilden. You didn't say anything about Tilden. You didn't say anything about Shelton. Well, I did uh, discuss that with Shelton one time. We had a convention in the uh, McFadden's Hotel, upstate New York, and was, the idea was we were going to form a new international natural hygiene society. And this was to get away from the old god, you know, that was very conservative. And uh, this was, it was about 1959, something like that, around there. And Shelton, Vetrano, and Dr. Curcio, and, uh, and uh, a Florida doctor, and myself, and the director of the health guild, we were all up there. And uh, I picked a room in the uh, hall, there was a big hall, and, uh, and there was a little room on the side there, so I figured I'll take that, because it was uh, very convenient, and it was a private room. So I stayed there, and uh, one day Shelton came in and just looked and was looking around the place, you know. And uh, I went over to him, and I talked to him, and uh, then I finally brought up Caressa, and I asked him what he thought about Caressa. He said, uh, he said he thought it was unnatural to, uh, because, uh, you know, you, you're holding back. So, uh, and then uh, he gave me the, the viewpoint of some of the doctors, and uh, not the ones that I advocated for, those that didn't know about it, evidently. And then I, uh, I told him I had pra I'd been practicing it. I was practicing it that time. And uh, I, he asked me questions about it, and I described, you know, sublimation technique and all that. And uh, he said, like, mm, you know, well, uh, and uh, then he said, well, evidently, you know more about it than I do. <laughs> I was you. amazed because, you know, Dr. Sheldon, to hear a man of his caliber to say a thing like that, you know. No doctor ever talks like that, you know. They always try to keep a, uh, a demeanor of, you know, of uh, doing everything. So you were impressed? Oh, yeah. That uh, that. Was my that's that when I, my greatest impression of him came right right out. After that, I I realized he was morally right on top, morally right on top of the whole all the hygienic doctors. He was honest. You see, if you ever get a doctor to admit he doesn't know more than you, <laughs> that's the, that's the personality, you know. So he, you were in your thirties, and he was in his sixties. Uh, well, yeah, that was, uh, I think, uh, might have been the beginning of Parkinson's. Well, anyway, uh, that was a debate between Dr. Kirsten and Shelton that lasted 10 days. And, uh, I think, and Dr., let's see, the director of the health guild asked me if I would record the whole thing. And you did? And, uh, he, yeah, he, 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 yeah, he invited me to, you know, he said he, he wanted me to record the whole thing for posterity, you know? And do you still have it? Yeah, but there's so much static in it now. But there was uh, that it was a wonderful s a series. Did you ever hear anything more about the Shelton and Caressa? Since then? Yeah. No. Not from him. Well, I, I, that's right. Caressa, uh, well, he advocated, he told me about Caressa. I mean, I heard it from a woman, and then, I, co I went to his meeting to meet him, uh, to discuss it, to see if she was telling me the truth, you know, because I didn't want to make a big change in my life at that point. At that point, I was, up, I was practicing brahmacharya. I was abstaining from all sex. And she was saying that, uh, don't do that. She says, you can have the best of both worlds. You, why, why isolate yourself, and, uh, you know? Like a monk, you know, well, I'm like a monk in society. But you can have a wonderful life of best. So I said, wow. I said, if that's possible, it's the greatest thing I ever heard. But then I said, let me check it out first, you know. And I asked if she knew anybody that knew about that, that I could talk to. And then she mentioned Dr. Curcio. So I asked her, I asked directions. She says he comes in every Friday to take care of patients in the health food store. So I went down one Friday, and there were about 12 people hanging around there, waiting for him. And then when it came to my turn, I asked him about it, and he said to me, 
says, now is not a good time to talk about it. Why don't you come to my castle, he said, and then we can spend time and we can go through everything. And yeah. I went there uh, another day and we spent three and a half hours on it. And, uh, and you know, I, I was so impressed with it. He so, it was so much beautiful. He had so nice and so, so you know, so natural. He wasn't, didn't act like a doctor. He acted like a, a, a person that you couldn't talk to. Then I, see, I, I said, I want to give him some money. I said, why can I give you, doctor? He says, he says, uh, uh, he says just give me $5. He says, $5? I says, that's not enough. <laughs> I said, uh, can I, I, can I give you more? He says, well, if you want, you can make a little contribution to natural hygiene. So I said, no, good. Then I says, well, can I give you 20? He says, sure. So I gave him $20. And that was the beginning of my friendship. Why do you think Curcio took up Caress about not Shelton? I don't know. Well, maybe Shelton, uh, Shelton was a more of a Puritan, more, more uh, uh, of a book man, puritanical. And Curcio was uh, more worldly. Because Curcio used to read medical journals. He used to subscribe to a lot of medical journals and look for ideas that he could use in natural hygiene. And uh, that's why I, res I respected him for that because he he was very open to all people. And not only that, but he, uh, he was Italian. He was a fastidious dresser. And he was kind of like the women. And the women thought he was very, uh, you know, like a Rudolph Valentino type. He was, he was very sophisticated. Oh. He, he looked sophisticated. And, and he had an enormous library, right? He was, you know, in all the years I knew him, he never said a harsh word to me. And I knew him over 40 years. No, how's that? So you have just as good impression of Shelton as of Curcio. Well, I knew Shelton was... Uh, performed uh, one of the greatest things in history. He took uh, 150 years of natural hygiene that was full of a lot of things that didn't belong there. He took out, he pointed out the faults of the of uh, hydrotherapy and all that stuff and said, it's not a curative agent, it's just a stimulant. You know? And they said, we didn't need it. And then, uh, but Curcio knew what Shelton knew. The only thing is he... Uh, he was into. He had other knowledge too. He used blended salads. He used egg yolks, and Shelton did not do that. They both were fasting. That they had big institutions, but then they took away Curcio's place. The medical men get the city got the city to rezone it as a uh, landmark. It was a castle was built out of stone. It was beautiful. So when they lost his castle, he, he decided uh, not to build a, not to go to another place to leave the area. Then he, came to, then he started traveling. He came to New York, you know, traveled to Chicago, all over. Castle? Where was it? It was upstate New York. They're talking about New York City. He bought a home in New York City, which was uh, hours away from Rochester. Do you know anything about Tilden and Caressa? Well, I don't remember reading anything about Tilden talking about Caressa, but Tilden was a big writer. He, he had... Uh, I had about uh, 30 magazines of his, and uh, I have uh, I have his best books, and uh, I sold the magazines. In those days, I sold them much. I sold them for a dollar piece. But in those days, there was a lot of money, $30. So uh, now I'm sorry, because and then I had a uh, book. Uh, I got a big book on Tilton. Uh, one of the doctors gave me a present of the book, and then I had another book. And uh, I, I think I sold those two, but then I regret it later. But before I sold it, one of the books said that he recommended every patient to take a silver dollar size of raw chopped meat every day. I never forgot that, because I, that was a mystery to me why he recommended that. But later on, I found out why. They, they were so smart, that children. I tell them, I have his best books, you know, the two books. Uh, the two books, the whole medical treatment, I mean, the whole treatment of disease. And he had approached him as a little different from Shelton. But it was, uh, you know, and look, he wrote the book, Toxemia and uh, Innovation. That was one of the greatest books ever written. It was a small book, but it was, but Tilton wrote it, and that became 
that became like uh, the one of the, the main law of life. They tried Gene. After he wrote that, uh, everyone knew children, you know. He, you know that he had a sanitarium with Black Lawn? He had a sanitarium, I think, in Ohio, or no, 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 sure, Pennsylvania. It was a whole block of buildings. The whole street, like a New York street, you know. They, he, he had, they used everything, physiotherapy, massage, and, you know, diet, fasting. It was a fasting institution. In those days, what they called it, were they called it uh, hydropathic institutes, things like that. Mm-hmm. Meaning, oh, meaning a water cure. Like when they called it water cures. So he was into some hydrotherapy. Well, that was the fashion of those things. He used it, but uh, he didn't, he didn't uh, emphasize it as important. They used it because people asked for it. It was in fashion. You know, he knew all these things. He, 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 he would keep them bad, you know. But his diets, he thought they were pretty bad, you know, because they were using apple pie and stuff, and cereals and all kinds of things. Because they didn't know nutrition in the 1800s, you know. Because the people there in those days were, they weren't using any toxic food. They, they didn't, they didn't spoil the food except the, like the white sugar and the white flour. Outside of that, they, they left the food alone. So the people had better vitality. So Shelton improved the diet compared to Tilda. Well, Shelton uh, brought it up to the raw state, the, the way it's found in nature. Tilda, uh, you know, I guess he was... Uh, he, he, gave, he gave the people a little, a little comfort food that they were used to. When you're in the sanitarium, uh, you could be strict that they can stay for two weeks, but some of these people came for months, and uh, you had to feed them. Uh, ju- just a qu- another question about uh, Carezza. You said uh, that 90, 75% of men were early ejaculators um yeah, Mark. yeah, I guess, I guess, they, sure, because anybody who was eating spicy food could run into that. Because that irritated the prostate and the sex glands and then made it more sensitive. So a little friction, and, uh, they could go out of control. But if a man, lives out of, if a man is a vegetarian and he lives in raw food, then for him to practice caress is easy. Because he doesn't get the... He doesn't run into a premature ejaculation. His body's more calm, more peaceful. See, people that are nervous are very explosive, right? Their temperaments, their emotions, and everything, and also, if it came to sex, they, they were more explosive. So you have to, you have, like, the best thing is, like, fit for life. You know, they wrote that book, and, it, and he was a disciple of Fry, and he recommended Fry's work. And uh, he recommended lots of fruit, and he even gave, he even gave diets for the conventional people in there. Cooked foods and all that, so there was a book that everybody that picked up could find something he could use. So that's why it became a bestseller. But if you write a book on the raw food, and that's and that said there's no compromise. You know? Look, there was a man by the name of Bill Cherry. I remember him. He opened up a hotel in the Catskills, you know, when, when Catskills were very big. And everybody was going up there to hear the famous, you know, show people and, and stars and comics. And he opened up a raw food hotel. And uh, the vegetarians came up there, you know, the Vegetarian Society, the Natural Hygiene Society. But, you know, he had to close it after a few years. He started that. People are frustrated. Did you give him a diet of Give them a diet of raw food, they're hungry. And if they you, you know, cooked food is uh, like potatoes, but, but that Russian woman, she says it's, and she analyzed it psychologically. She came to the conclusion that it was uh, addictive. And I agree with her totally because uh, I, mean, I went through my whole life examining my experiences uh, with trying to live on a raw diet, and I remember. Uh, the way I rationalized breaking the diet and eating cooked foods and cheating and all that. But uh, and that was, and I, I refused to use the word addiction for myself, you know. I didn't admit that. But after meeting her and analyzing it, it was really addictive, but I just uh, wouldn't look at it that way, you know. Briefly, the raw food is more helpful for disease, but I don't dwell on it. You know, just a, a little bit here and there. And then let it go, and then stick to strictly Carreza. The, the pleasures of Carreza and birth control and all that, where people can do it. If you talk about raw foods, you can lose 99% of them all. Now, Botenko, in that 12 steps, gives the whole psychology.
efficiency of dealing with people and patients on raw diets and had and had them uh, handle them. And she explains uh, the psychology of it, and she does a marvelous job. In fact, I'm very impressed. She so she understood the psychology of the raw diet better than anybody else I read. I would take this attitude that uh, don't tell them what diet they should go on. Just find out where they're at and start to and improve the diet. Give them a little bit of time and they feel it, they, they like it, they get better results. Then they'll ask you, uh, what, how can I go further? But if you tell them, oh, the raw diet is the ultimate and if you're eating cooked foods, you're uh, addictive. You know? If you go on that, you, you, you give them something that they may not be ready for. Uh, you know, I'll give you an example. I, I was going up with a girl for 10 years. She was an Italian girl. She was very beautiful. And uh, we practiced Therese for 10 years and finally I married her. And uh, in the time we were married, I never told her what to do with diet. I never criticized what she was doing. I never said a word. I just ate my thing and let her do what she wanted. And after one year, she came over to me and she asked me, how she could change her diet, you know, and then she became interested. She became ready for it, especially when you're with a person and that person is doing this, living a certain way, and they're very happy with it. Then you say to yourself, oh, he's got something. What is it? I want to find out about it. He's got a secret that I can use. I want to be happy like him. And that's then that it starts, seeing that the person becomes ready. But uh, to use psychology or even reason, <laughs> you know, reason, reason is not as strong as emotion. Emotion is like a, a tsunami compared to reason, and uh, reason is like a walk in the park. Now, the average person lacks absolute confidence in himself or herself. Even they have PhDs. There are things about themselves that they, they feel inferior about. Now, Carreza, it gets rid of inhibitions. It gets rid of subconscious repression where energy is damped. It, it, it liberates the person's spirits. It frees them mentally and emotionally. And it prolongs the life for a man, or for, also for a woman. When a woman is happy with Carreza, she's going to live longer. She's not going to waste all her energy and emotions and, and depression and feeling bad. All that energy goes into uh, health. It increases the health. The uh, exercise. Oh, exercise is uh, a must. Uh, there any animal that does not exercise loses its uh, exuberance. And uh, ex exercise is an important part. And even you take the athletes. They, they can live on garbage. The exercise alone makes them feel great. I used to practice careers and I used to use a lot of energy at the beginning because I was confident I could control myself, and I wasn't afraid to move violently and forcefully in uh, all different directions and uh, to, uh, to excite a woman. But uh, if you talk about Tantra, the easy, that's a, that's, that's a different thing. Tantra is a, a meditation type of Kareza, which is, uh, leads to a spiritual path. The other leads to uh, a release of all inhibitions and frustrations psychological uh, liberation technique. When people get into Carreza, they get liberated from the frustrations and they, and they move the way they feel they want to move. And they're not ashamed to move violently. And some women, you know, I can't I say, some women actually holler, scream from ecstasy. <laughs> some of them scared me. I remember one woman I was going out with that she was an aunt of a girl uh, that was going out with the accordion player. I mean, aunt used to visit her, and she asked the accordion player if he could get her somebody, one of the boys in the band, so he asked me. So now, uh, she moved like, uh, God, she must have used up thousands of calories in the movements, and she she felt tremendous afterwards. And uh, But the only thing wrong with her was she had to get high to get started because she was... She had a split personality. She was like a timid when she was sober, and when she had alcohol, she became uh, liberated. When you deal with the average person, then you have to bring in, bring in their, their minds and the subconscious liberation and freedom, but it's become free, free of frustrations and unhappiness and the negative emotions, become liberated and uh, creative, and releasing the creative instinct. So if they're interested in music, they become better.
lot of musicians, if they were actresses, and become tremendous actresses, you know? And, you know, sex gives some of the best jokes. Oh, yeah. Whenever I get into an occasion where people are nervous and we want to talk about, you know, and I get to throw, I start throwing them light jokes, see? And then, as they start laughing, then they can increase the jokes, you know? To make them uh, uh, more, more stronger. But I used to do that just for fun, but uh, I don't do that anymore. If probably if I were lecturing, giving lectures on Carreza, I'd start... Uh, I like jokes. I don't like storytellers, because storytellers drag out a joke, and they, they, demand, you, they demand your attention. They're very boring until the punchline. I don't like... I like one line. It's fast. Boom. Fast. You know? And uh, Joey Adams was a one-liner. He, he'd give you... Uh, he, he'd give you a joke that takes 15, 30 seconds, and, and, then, and they break, break him up. Another one who was great is Jackie Miles. He, he was studying to be a rabbi, and then he became a comic. He's one of the greatest comics in New York. He has a whole show, just himself. He must be in the 60s now. And one of his jokes that <laughs> I think about a laugh. He was saying he, he, he was walking around when he tells show, walks around the room, sometimes he walks in the aisles, and he says, I says, you know what happens to you? He says, you know what happens to you if you, if you don't have sex for a long time? Look at look at him. Look at, look at that guy. And he's pointing to the French first row. <laughs> and everybody's looking around. And the people in the first row, they're looking around. He's not pointing at anybody. But just the pointing. And, and the men <laughs> in the first row, they start, like, hiding. So funny. He says, look at, look at him. Everybody <laughs> turns to look. And then and the, the house breaks up. Especially the front row. Everybody starts slapping. They don't know who he's pointing. Yeah, stuff like that. And I, I like stuff like that because, you know, if you make people laugh, they feel good. And it's, and it's good. No, what about the cousins, you know? This uh, cousin who was in the hospital, and he said things, and bedridden and all that. You ever read the story about him, Norman Cousins? They used to put little movies on for, pe for people there. So he, they put the, uh, the, uh, the Three Stooges. The Marx Brothers and all that, the real, uh, what you call, slapstick guys. They slap each other. And he broke them and he started laughing. And he got well so quick that he checked out of the hospital. And he wrote a book about it. Yeah. And he doesn't give you any jokes, but he tells you, he, 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 he speaks of the value of humor. He says, if you can make people laugh, he says, you do the, you do the greatest thing for them you can. Because once you, they laugh, they, they relax and Everything changes. So, uh, so what, that's what I truly try to do. Like one time, one time I taught Carreza to on the, on the telephone. He was telling me I'm a born again Christian. But he's trying to tell, sell me on, on born again Christianism, and he's he's working very hard trying to sell it me. And I'm trying to get out of the subject. I don't want to talk about it. So with a guy like that, then I try to find a way to make him laugh. I bring up jokes. Well, anyway, so that's the value of humor. If you get into a bad situation, and if you can make people laugh and relax, then it's, uh, I, I, I bring in humor to my wedding. And you know, the humor sells it. One funny line. I got one funny line. And this is after the vows and the rings and all that. And I say, and I say to the groom, you know, you know, Robert, in order to have a happy marriage, the three most important words you should always remember to say to your bride, and these words are, it's 